I do need to welcome a couple of people. Our newest Supremo, Amelia, and our newest uh, Taco, Lauren. Um, Shannon. Shannon. I don't Shannon. know why I said Lauren. What's up, guys? Shannon and Amelia. Welcome, welcome. Um, so as a, as a Taco Supremo, you get unlimited access to us. Well, I mean, as oh. unlimited as you can get <laughs> across the internet. It's unlimited to Jen. So how's uh, that? What, what parts of us? <laughs> so I can only go so long uh, here. It's, this reminds me of the uh, uh, Bob's Burgers episode we just watched. <laughs> Baby, you don't need a backstage pass. Yeah. Was it? So you get access to our Patreon um, Taco Supremos. You also get some swag. We always send out a card to you and you also get a signed uh, Lieutenant Joe Kenda picture. Well, he's if, a you, if, you yeah. sign, if you sign up for the full year as a full Supremo, year. Full year we're as a Supremo. This is my first year. This is my first time. <laughs> this, is your first. this is my first time uh, 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 plugging it. We're so. showing the pictures. I, was, I did. A pretty picture, a pretty I did show a them. picture. So these are Joe Kenda. And so if you sign up for a full year, you get. Of a Supremo membership. Let's be clear. Full year of Supremo. And he signed every one of these. I bought them all in auction. They're different ones. So Ooh, this is there's three different ty- mysterious. types. Mysterious. I bought them all in an auction. I bought them all, literally. I was like, fuck it. I'm buying every I'll one of them. I'll take the lot. Yeah. They're numbered, too. So you get one of those. Those are pretty rare. I paid pretty good for them. And uh, a bunch of other stuff. Did you tell them about the comic books and all that good stuff? No. We also have true crime comic books and true crime trading cards. You get two true crime trading cards. For Supremos. For Supremos. Um, everyone gets a shout out. and um, Everyone our, gets ad-free episodes. Everyone gets ad-free episodes. I feel like you guys, sh- I need to practice plugging this because I'm not good. So let's. Uh, Nachos will get a, a signed card and sticker from us in the mail. Yes. Yeah. And for the Supremos, the biggest thing is uh, you get an exclusive ad-free episode that we do after this one. And that's going to be for y'all. Um. Okay. So this is for Emily. Surprise shots. Surprise shots. We don't know what they are because they're a surprise. Cheers, y'all. Cheers. I hope you were kind to us today, Jen. Mm. Was that Kahlua? It was not. It was um, Bailey's. No, it was not. What was it, Jen? It was the Stroopwapple. Oh, I forgot we still had that. Yeah. All right. So we're on the Google Earth right now. And this is New York City, or as the Spaniards call it, Nuevo Yorko. <laughs> I don't think that's what they call it. <laughs> Just for the record. Nu- Nuevo York. <laughs> that's pretty much it. Let's go to Tompkins Square. We'll start there. Tompkins Square, which is right here, which is crazy, right? I mean, crazy that New York puts parks in the middle of the damn. I mean, green space is important, you know, public parks. Yeah, I know. But the, the parks just become like cesspools for, I mean, and tent cities and stuff. For crime. Yeah. I could be. So this is, uh, this is where I want to start tonight. Tompkins Square Park. If you're from New York, let me know if you've been there. It'd be really interesting to know. I will tell you at the time of this story, which happened in 1989, this Tompkins Square Park was a tent city. I did go down here yesterday on the Google Earth and looked around here and it is no longer a tent city. So, and that was 89. That was like 30 something years ago. Mm -hmm. It's important that we're starting here because the main character tonight lives in this park for a lot of the story. Let's just say that. Trash. I'm the trash man. (laughs) (laughs) That's a show we need to rewatch, I think. Yeah, that's a good one. It's been a couple years since we watched the whole show. We're talking about a Daniel Rakowitz. I'm going to show you this guy's picture and everything else. Go to talkmore.com. If you're listening to this on podcast, you can see all the photos there. This is something you definitely want to see. This story is pretty gruesome. I'm not going to lie. But Daniel Rakowitz, he was homeless at one point and he moved in with a friend that he met that he actually sold pot to in a Washington Square Park. Mm -hmm. This this guy, Daniel Rakowitz, is a marijuana distributor, small dealer, but he Ken? has he has the hookup, the hookup, and he delivers it literally all over New York hmm. via a pager. Oh, like a liar. <laughs> yeah, but it's but not remember like, <laughs> pagers. Wow. Maybe it's a beeper. I don't know. In, this is the same this thing. The same thing. I, I will say for the talk of primos, I want to watch the the interrogation of this guy. You're going to you're going to F and love this guy. But in the interrogation the cops asking them all these questions his beeper goes off and it's loud it's like beep 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 beep. he's like oh is that emergency out of weed is that me and he looks at it and says do you mind if i make a few marijuana deliveries (laughs) and the cop's like what yes actually i do mind so that's who we're talking about tonight (laughs) 
<laughs> oh my gosh. This guy, this guy is gonna be a new favorite. All right. <laughs> I'm, I'm digging his vibe. That's cool. All right. It's fun. I'm picking up what he is putting down as <laughs> as a uh, weed delivery man. He almost looks like Jared Leto. Oh, he does. Yes. I see it. I yeah. see it. Our Jesus. Jared. Jared's weed cult Jesus. photos. <laughs> you weed know. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a pretty good looking dude. There's an interview with him. He's very jovial. Hmm. Very nice. And well, yeah. He- if you're smoking weed, of course you're going to be. <laughs> like, if that's like your day job. like That is his job. Yeah. Um, Speaking of Jesus, I've been listening to Jesus Christ Superstar a lot recently. I was really wondering where it's, you were going with speaking of Jesus. It's it's one of the most classic rock operas out there, rock musicals. It's great. I love it. It's not a musical person. Really. I know you're not, and, and it makes me sad, but you know what? Everyone likes what they like. That's right. So, so August 17th, this is 1989, Tompkins Square Park, Daniel Rakowitz is making a usual delivery to one of his, his good friends. This friend, her name is Sylvia. She's going to provide a lot of what happened tonight. Okay. Sylvia is dating this guy named Sean. And at one point, and this was very recent to the story, Sylvia and Sean were living at that apartment that I showed you. Okay. In New York. East. East. Yeah. Ninth. 700 East, whatever. Ninth. And Daniel Rakowitz, the one I just showed you, the stone Jesus, was also a roommate. So these guys are really good friends. And we're going to get into this, but Sylvia and Sean, they, started going through a little a little turbulence in their relationship mm-hmm. so they decided to split so now Daniel Rakowitz has this apartment by himself but at this point where we're starting August 17th he is simply in Tompkins Square Park selling Sylvia some more pot because that's that's who she goes to and this is when he asked her to do something that kind of threw her off balance I mean she's just there to buy pot and say hey you know you're looking good hope everything's going good everything Things great with me and Sean. And then he says, yeah, so um, I got this roommate who you know by now, Monica. She just moved in. Are we talking about Friends? I don't remember there being a murder episode on Friends. I thought of that too. The one where someone gets murdered. Yeah. <laughs> we should name the episode that. Monica Burl. All right, so Monica's with a K, M-O-N-I-K-A, Burl. Can you describe her? This is Monica. Um, Thin eyebrows, long, long nose, hair. long face, long hair. I'm going to tell you all about her background, but at this point, she is living in that apartment that Sylvia just moved out of and Daniel is currently living in. I keep thinking you're going to say Daniel Radcliffe when you say his name, but you're not. Uh, Harry no, Potter. Not. He, he was in that Weird Al biopic that was really just a parody biopic because it's Weird Al, but it was really good. It was good, but if it was a parody. Somebody should make a parody about the Weird Al movie because he makes parodies about everything. The Weird Al movie was a was parody. Was a parody. That's what she's saying. Made by him, right? Yeah, Weird Al was like a yeah, but he producer. makes parodies of songs. Yeah. No one's ever parodied, parodied him. Like no one, no one, like, so he made Beat It. Yeah. And to Eat It. Right. So someone should make a parody of Eat It to, no, in, to but back in, to Beat no, It. But, but, I don't but in the movie, <laughs> so in the movie, uh, I'm not, I don't want to spoil the whole movie, but in the movie, when he writes Eat It, he, he's, he makes it, it, the movie makes it seem like it was his original song and Michael Jackson wrote a parody of Eat It called ah. Beat It. And it was a whole thing. And, and and Al was like, I'm not writing original music anymore. Like it was like a whole thing. You would, I think you, I don't know. I don't know if you would like it. I don't know what you'd like anymore. Daniel Rakowitz, he's living with this girl named Monica. I know it's confusing. You have Sylvia and Sean. They moved out of the apartment that they were living with Daniel Rakowitz. Daniel Rakowitz met this girl named Monica, M O N I K A. Oh, and, okay. she, and she moved in. Okay, so Daniel and Monica are living in the apartment that Sean and Sylvia used to live in. Got it. Daniel was in. Tompkins Park selling Sylvia some weed and says, hey, by the way, can you help me kill Monica? Oh. So... And this is what she said. Daniel, what are you, crazy? I ain't gonna help you with anything, recalls Sylvia. He was really nervous. He was terrified. He was so terrified of being homeless. Now, this guy, Daniel Rakowitz, was homeless before. It was very traumatic for him being homeless. We're t- we'll talk about his background, but he had a lot of friction with his father growing up. His mother died right in front of him. Oh. He left home. He's down on his luck. He ended up on the streets. He's living in Tompkins Square. He's friendly to everyone. Everyone loves him, but just 
just not going with food, being cold, freezing cold, having to beg. He's terrified of being homeless. He doesn't make a lot of money selling weed. And I'll tell you why. He's a terrible weed dealer. He smokes all of his supply. And that's why he doesn't make any money. That's just completely. And he'll even say that in the interrogation he does. He smokes a shit ton of pot, a lot a pot. And so he never really makes any good money. So Sylvia was actually letting him stay kind of free in the in the apartment. At this point, she's just trying to buy some weed. Daniel says, hey, can you help me kill Monica? I know you don't like her anyway. Sylvia met her once, didn't like her. You met her anyway. You know, can can you help me kill her? Just, things aren't working with this new roommate situation, right? She just she just moved in a month ago. Shit's not working. So instead of moving out or going somewhere else or cutting ties, let's it's just kill her. Let's just kill yeah. her. Will yeah. you will you help me kill her? Now, Daniel Rakowitz, as you'll see, says a lot of things. So you don't really know what the serious level is at first. So Sylvia wasn't sure if he was joking or if he was serious. And that's pretty commonplace with this guy. And like I said, here's the situation. Sylvia and her boyfriend, Sean, they were living in this apartment. They moved Daniel Rakowitz in, who doesn't have any money. He was living there free. Sylvia and Sean broke up. They moved out. Now Daniel Rakowitz has to pay $603 a month for this apartment that he can't afford by himself. So he meets Monica, who he was selling her weed. Got and it. he's like, hey, you know, I got this apartment. Yeah. Boom. Now you guys are on board. Good. So this is the origin story of Friends that I didn't know I needed. <laughs> That's how they all really met. Yeah. Yeah. So Sylvia, the next day, she goes back to the apartment that Daniel and Monica's living in. Daniel looks pretty disheveled, like he's been up all night. She also noticed uh, it wasn't a, a strong stench yet, but it was in the makings of a stench. Oh, boy. She noticed that Daniel didn't come to the door right when she knocked and that his music on his radio was blasting through the halls. So she got kind of worried about what's going on. Daniel lets her in. Mm -hmm. She walks in. She knows something's up. She looks at Monica's door, which is shut. She's getting this weird feeling. So she walks into the kitchen. On Saturday night, I could see from the street that the apartment was dark and I knew something was wrong, but I went up there anyway. I was climbing up the stairs and I heard Daniel's TV and it was really loud. And I opened the door and his TV was in the kitchen. It was very dim. I went back to my room to make sure my stuff was okay because I told him I was leaving it there for a while until I got it out. And Monica's door was closed and I went and knocked on Monica's door and nobody answered. So I went to the kitchen and on the stove there was a pot and in the pot was Monica's head. Oh, damn. She was all burnt up and her eyes were closed. <gasps> Jesus. Why have we done so many stories with like a head in a stock pot? Like, what the? Like, is that people's automatic thought? It's just like, mm, I don't know where to put this. Yeah, maybe I'll put this in the, this. This pot looks like it's big enough to hold a head. You know what? I was thinking about that yesterday. That's a really good point. And Daniel obviously cut this head off. But we've done a lot of cases where you dismember a body. 100% of the cases we've done, 100% where dismemberment is a factor, the head is the first thing to go for whatever reason. So you, you have a body that you need to cut up. For some reason, maybe it's in our DNA genetic makeup, we're like, all right, we got to cut the head off first. The head goes first and then the arms, not the hands, the arms go and then the legs and then the hands and then the feet. It's always in that weird order. Well, I, I think maybe it the head goes first and only the only reason I could think is because if you take the head off, then you're not looking at the, <laughs> like, like you have just, a body in front of you, but it doesn't look like the person uh, that you uh, killed. You kind of depersonalize it. It's just like a mannequin yeah i mean it's not but i mean it, maybe that's what they're thinking i don't know I, you know sometimes i just start to say these things and then i think halfway through i'm like you should probably not say these things the way you say them huh? and it just doesn't you know does daniel rakowitz look like someone who would put a head in a pot no right i mean how did that head get there can't be him it's like the beginning of pineapple express right like weed right is it pineapple where they talk about like weed doesn't make you angry like <laughs> yeah all right, let me talk a little bit, a little bit about this guy. They called him the Chicken Man around Tompkins Square because he kept a live rooster in his backpack. I was gonna say I'm known as the Chicken Lady at Costco. <laughs> yeah. That's a different reason, though. For a very different reason. Yeah. Because I buy so many rotisserie chickens every week. How many a week do you buy? Like five, six. 
Yep. That's all I eat is chicken. She doesn't cook, just chicken. It's false. It's for the dogs. So this guy, Daniel Rakowitz, grew up in Victoria, Texas. His mother died when he was two, and that was very traumatic for him. He mm-hmm. saw her die right there on the floor. And after that, he developed some serious, serious daddy issues. Sounds like he needs some therapy. Now, his father was a deputy sheriff. And this is they grew up in a very small Texas town. Very small. Small police force. The father was a deputy sheriff there. And this is what uh, this is what the sheriff of Rockport, Texas, recalls. From the Victoria Advocate, September 12th, 1989, his father was a straight-laced fellow, a real disciplinarian. Sheriff Robert Hughes of Rockport, Texas, recalled, but the boy, he was a mental basket case, I guess you'd have to say. Sheriff Roberts, he also recalled that, quote, the boy was very hot-tempered. He tore up his daddy's trailer a couple times. We had him in here for marijuana at least once. Tony finally threw him out, the father. The last he was here, he hadn't gotten to the Jesus thing yet. You could see he was headed for some big trouble though. Now, the father who has declined all interviews from every reporter so we kind of can see that he may be like this, was abusive and and just kind of a mean person. He was a deputy sheriff and he caught his son at 16 years old with a bag of marijuana. So instead of scolding him, he booked him. (laughs) He he booked him, his own son in jail. (laughs) That's one way to teach a lesson. I mean, (laughs) holy shit. Yikes. Kind of fucked up, man. So Daniel Rakowitz, he was never really going anywhere in life. In 19, he enlisted in the Army. He trained in the Army in a law enforcement program as an MP, Hmm. and he was doing well. He got discharged. Everything was fine. So he applied for a job alongside his father in that small police station. I'm surprised he would want to do that. Well, if he had had, such if you have daddy issues, you have, you you know, you try to appease. That's what that is. So he wanted to be by his father. Maybe they can work things out and he and the father turned it down quote i want to do everything as a texas sheriff and i'm going to have many counties where a lot of people that smoke marijuana can come he's in new york he's now homeless he started working as a part-time cook and that didn't really work for him so he became a marijuana dealer and like i said he would just smoke up all his inventory now he met sylvia his going to be roommate not monica the one in mm-hmm. the pot he met sylvia as a the week- one in the pot I'm sorry. So Sylvia was not only was not only a a buyer of his weed. She also saw something beautiful in this man. This man is a kind soul. He's very kind. I'm not sure mm. about that. I mean, besides the head thing. Yeah, just, uh, well, that's kind it, of a big thing. I know, but if I didn't tell <laughs> well, you about the head. I mean, like, she didn't know he was going to do that. Like, she, before he did the head thing, well, said he was he, a kind soul. That's what she thinks. She's, but apparently he had anger issues when he was younger. Or maybe it was just a bad trip. Maybe Maybe his pot was laced with something. There you go. Mm. So, I'm not trying to make excuses for him. I'm just saying. So Sylvia saw something beautiful in this man. He is a very kind soul. And he is, as you'll see, when you hear him talk, you can tell he's a very nice guy. And he's the type of guy that would do anything for anyone, which I, I let me tell you, just hold on a second. I'm, I'm going to prove this to you. I, I'm just not seeing how we're saying this guy is like the nicest guy. And yet he's <laughs> decapitated somebody. Well, you don't John even know. Wayne Gacy he, was pretty big in okay. his community. Yeah. You don't even know. Are we really going to go there? All right. Anyway. Great dude. You know, child molester, murderer. It's fine. She saw something beautiful in this man. So she said, you know what? I know you're down on your luck. I want to get you out the street. Why don't you come and live with with me and my boyfriend, Sean. And then she saw a change in Daniel. I saw a change in Daniel. He felt like he was a normal person, explained Sylvia. He had a home, he could take a shower, and he had a big TV. In fact, Rakowitz developed a fixation for television. He'd watch until the dawn, saying, come on, Sylvia, watch TV, just one more show. There's something good coming on. Mm-hmm. I wonder if he was a big Jeopardy guy. I'm always say that. Now, I, I will tell you, he was a big cartoon guy. Mm. <laughs> Eating, uh, you know, Captain Crunch in his pajamas. It was the late 80s, so is this like a Ren and Stimpy guy? Uh, I think Ren and Stimpy was the 90s, That's right? 90s, yeah. Early 90s, right? We're talking about Beavis and Boothead. That was a uh, Boothead. <laughs> she saw a change, and this guy's finally coming out of his shell. Now, he spent two years there in the apartment, happy as a clam. Him, Sean, and Sylvia. Everything was going great until Sean and Sylvia started having some, some girlfriend-boyfriend troubles. 
So when they decided to split, so did Sylvia. And when Sylvia's gone, Rakowitz can't afford this a place by himself mm-hmm. at all. So that's where we are. But for those two years, not only was he doing great and he was going places, he was kind of getting his foot, his footing in life, but he was also, to prove my point earlier, giving to everyone. He was uh he wanted everyone to be well fed and to be happy. Mm-hmm. So he would he just came from Tompkins Square Park. He knows everyone there. He he knows what it's like not to eat. He knows what it's like to be freezing at night. So constantly he would go down to the key food on 4th and B Street. He would sit there all day. He would do this a few times a week. He would sit there all day and he would ask for donations. He would, you know, kind of panhandle a little bit. Mm-hmm. And even if someone, people would buy him food like potatoes, rice, chicken, he would take all of this food that he bought right there in the mart. He would go home to the house, cook it all in a stove or on the, cook it all on the stove and then feed the homeless people. Mm. Every He would feed all the homeless people because he knows what it's like to go hungry. Yeah. And so, I mean, is that not a good guy? I mean, I don't know. He prepared a lot of chicken mainly, said Jerry the Peddler, a local squatter and community leader. He'd feed people a couple or three times a week. Sometimes he showed up with breakfast. He'd make stacks of pancakes for everyone, said Sean, a dark, muscular, 25-year-old electrician. And he even used to get the syrup from the people in the street. He'd never pay for any of this. We cooked up everything. It was fun and it was good. He had consideration for other people. He knew what it was like because he had been homeless. Mm. So, but then everything changed when he had to get a new roommate. So let's talk about Monica. Look at this photo. Tell me what you think her career is. Model. Sort of. I'm guessing that's fake blood. Makeup artist. No, it's not a makeup artist. She's actually a classical dancer. Oh. And not just the type of dancers at a Big Ray's Titty Shack up the street, which she did work <laughs> at Big Ray's Titty Shack, but that was only to make ends meet. Was but, that the actual name of it? Yeah, yeah, it was something like that. Oh my gosh, when I was... <laughs> Big <laughs> race titty shack. <laughs> when I was uh, younger... When I was younger... I, I don't know where that story is going from. When I was younger... Shack. When I was younger... <laughs> no, he said to make ends meet. When I was younger, I thought the phrase was to make ends meet as an end apostrophe S meet because like the end of the meat was like the worst cut. And oh, like, like M-E-A-T? You could, M-E-A-T and like this the worst cut in the it's like the cheapest maybe and like you can only afford the cheapest i didn't realize it was to make like that's not that's not as bad as my sideboard sideboard thing <laughs> sideboard <laughs> <laughs> so stupid <laughs> so at this point daniel rackwitz needs to pay rent and he meets monica selling her pot monica is a 26 year old dirty blonde dancer from switzerland she is a modern dancer with a certificate in choreography mm. One of her friends says, quote, though she had a reputation for dating adventurously, one friend says, she was a pretty smart girl. She seemed pretty professional. Oh, this did not age well. She seemed pretty professional and had a good head on her shoulders. Oh, that's the first time I noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> that did not. Oh God, that! <laughs> That's what it says. Like, it says bum, to you. Bum. She seemed pretty professional and had a good head on her shoulders. Holy shit! I didn't. That's the first time I read that. That's um ironic. Why would she say that after knowing her friend got her head cut off? <laughs> Who the fuck says that? She thinks she did that on purpose. No, I think it was like just a, a slip of the tongue, and you're like, oh my god, I wish I could just. Here, read Walk that. that one back. Oh, my God. <laughs> well, she had a good head on her shoulders. But <laughs> oh, man. Now, here's the thing. At the time, Monica was living at 93 Orchard Street in kind of a low-end place. And the apartment I showed you where Daniel Rakowitz was living was, you know, pretty pretty nice for where it was. Yeah. And, oh, man, would Monica love nothing else but to have that apartment all to herself. Ooh. So, mm-hmm. and she was promiscuous. So, promiscuous. she would want to bring all kind of boys in there. Wherever you are. So Daniel, not knowing Monica's true motives, I'm going to kind of sum it up, but they smoked a few joints. They went to his place. She agreed to live there. He cleans up the place the next few days for her to come in. And then instead of her signing the lease, he his name was never on the lease to begin with. Mm, okay. So she actually takes over the lease. Got it. And on that day where she takes over the lease, 
I mean, they've they've already been having sex and everything's going good. They're like happy. Dan, Daniel's going around selling pot, just being like, oh my God, this new girl I'm with, she's my girlfriend. You know, she's moving in. I love her. I'm so happy. As soon as she signs her name on the lease, things start going downhill quick. She stops the sex first thing. Her name's on the lease and his name is not on the lease. Mm-hmm. All right. You see what's going to go, go on? Mm-hmm. He'll say in the interview that the day she signed the lease, he went to the food store, bought a bunch of toppings for a pizza, and then he went home to make the pizza to celebrate. She ate half the damn pizza, and then she told him, hey, I want you to move out. That's rude. That's kind of fucked up. Hmm. So Daniel had cleaned up this place so immaculate before she moved in just for her, Sylvia says. Something about the arrangement bothered Sylvia. I told Daniel, this girl just wants the apartment, she recalls. He kept saying, no, but she cares about me, and she wants to live with me, and she wants to be my roommate. And I said, Daniel, she wants the apartment and she's going to take the apartment right from underneath you. She's going to have the lease in her name. And once it's in her name, she's going to throw you out. And I ain't going to be in here anymore. And there's nothing I can say when the lease is changed over. So she throws you out, you're out and you're homeless again. But but, but Daniel Rakowitz wouldn't listen. He'd say, I love her. I love her. <laughs> and I've never seen him go out with a girl, much less say that, hmm. Sylvia recalls. But it was, oh, Monica, do you want this or that? Oh, Monica, do you want me? to make you something to eat? I mean, it was just Monica everything. And then Sean comes in and says, quote, she treated him like shit. Mm. So she actually paid back the full lease from the months that was relapsed. She took over the apartment, stopped the sex, not only stopping the sex immediately, started being kind of a bitch Mm -hmm. to Daniel, telling him he's got to move out. She starts bringing other guys to the house to have sex with the guys. Okay. And then she even killed a cat from what Daniel would say that Daniel owned. She has a friend with a pit bull the pit bull came and killed the cat and she was laughing about it. That's I mean, terrible. This is a good guy. Daniel like really is a good dude. Like I know. I know the head thing, but just listen. Okay. So at this point, he's got two weeks to move out. Brackowitz is pleading, please, Sylvia, don't let her throw me out. I have nowhere to go. I can't, I can't be homeless again. That was his biggest fear is to be homeless. For about a week leading up, he was still delivering weed to all his contacts. He wasn't on planet Earth anymore. Mm-hmm. Right. He was just talking in his head over and over trying to decide if he should kill Monica or not. Quote, Daniel would go through this all day long, remembers Sylvia. He'd say, I'm going to kill her. And five minutes later, he'd say, no, I love her. I'm not going to kill her. He would just do it over and over and over and over and over Mm -hmm. in front of everyone. Everyone's hearing this, but they just thought he was crazy. Right. Right. So ultimately, obviously, he decided, yeah, right. Daniel would go through this all day long, remember, Sylvia. He'd say, I'm going to kill her. And five minutes later, he'd say, no, I love her. I'm not going to kill her. Sylvia recalls the murder scene. I walked to the very tip of the bedroom, of the bathroom. I didn't go in. And I saw the bathtub. What, what was it? Like a rib cage with everything off, just the bones, just the ribs. Ugh. And it was full of blood. Ugh. And there was like guts. So I left and I couldn't even lock the door. I was shaking so bad, but I locked the door because I thought, Jesus, if anybody sees this. So she didn't go to the police at first. Okay. And when she did question Daniel about it, it it's like, Daniel, did you, what what are these bones? Did you cut her up? What's her head doing in the pot? Quote, they can't arrest me because I can turn into a dog at will. Wait, what? (laughs) Like I said, he smokes a shit ton of weed. All right, let's, do you want to hear like how this guy talks real quick yeah. yeah let's just do a random interview just just a few seconds of it uh so you guys can hear let's see i would tell my dad i'm the lord dad you don't tell me to fold the clothes i only had to fold the clothes once a week my dad did all the other housework around the house i told him who are you to tell me to fold the clothes this is a one household that's most different than any on this earth you're my dad but i your son Happen to be your Lord. So therefore, you're going to do as I say. <laughs> oh, damn. <laughs> so he really is weed, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, man. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck he just said, honestly. <laughs> Something about folding clothes, yeah. man. Yeah, he was mad that his dad was making him fold the clothes because he's the Lord. Yeah, I think he is. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel Rakowitz was born on Christmas Eve, 1224, 1960. Mm. And 
And I had a video I want to show you. He was explaining that uh, his birth was uh, of divine divine means. And oh, because he was born at Christmas? He thinks he's like the reincarnated Ooh. Jesus legit? So he literally yeah. looks like that on purpose, not because he's a stoner. Wow. Yeah. We Jesus. Interesting. He wasn't born with divine powers, but he did receive them when he was five years old. He was looking at his wall and, quote, three lords looking like Jesus floated out of the wall one at a time. One wearing purple, one wearing yellow, and one wearing a blue robe. His parents put him in psych wards all through childhood. They would never den- confirm or deny this because they refused to talk to any reporters. Quote, from the age of 9 to 11, they forced me to take Ritalin, a drug prescribed for hyperactive children. The students decided to hit on me and spit on me. And if I defended myself, I got paddled. Hmm. He underwent shock therapy at 14 years old, and he was forced to take all kinds of drugs. Now, this is why he moves to New York after his dad kicks him out. On May May 3rd, 1983, I made a prayer that I would have a dream to learn future events, Rakowitz said. Hmm. Six days later, I did indeed have the dream, and it told me I would come into total possession of a 14-year-old girl, who two weeks later became my wife. And before we got married, I said, according to the dream, you're going to leave me, and I will go to New York and find a blonde-haired woman and get married. Someday I will come back, according to the dream. You will come back to me, but you will have an another man's child this is a very interesting prophecy yeah (laughs) there's uh, like so there's one woman there's one woman and a 14 year old girl and he's gonna marry the 14 year old girl and the other i don't know i'm confused there's too many moving parts Mm -hmm. after his arrest police let police did confirm that rakowitz was married before in texas to a mexican wife and one friend recalled quote she was really young he was upset when they split i think he hoped at first they would get back together daniel rakowitz is the Lord of Lords. He says, quote, I am the Lord of Lords. I am going to be president. And as the years... You get to be Lord and president? As the wow. year as the years progressed in Tompkins Park, he got a little darker with his prophecy, saying, "Quote: If they think Hitler was something, they haven't seen anything yet." What? One Clayton Patterson, a hat store owner, said, "Quote: He's a wacko. Daniel wasn't a great marijuana salesman. Daniel was, you know, a slow learner. He was kind of jovial looking, but but he was isolated, lonely. Danny Boy was always standing around by himself." Oh, Danny Boy, the pipes, the pipes are coming. The man had charisma, claims Jerry the Peddler. It took people a couple minutes to realize he was a kook, but he always managed to stop to get them to stop and listen to him. Most people didn't think of the guy as really being a nut. I used to talk to people about him. They go, oh no, he's harmless. I used to tell them, someday... He's going to kill somebody. I swear I did. Now, he has a cult. He is a he is known as a cult leader. Oh. However, this is one cult that I cannot f and understand. It's something to do with nine. It, instead of 666, it's 966. And he was born on the 24th, which which 1983 plus 24 plus uh, 12 equals like 993. Divide, it's fucking nuts. <laughs> Like it's, and he's talked so fast and he'll explain it. He tells everyone that he is this Lord of Lords. So technically he is a cult leader, although he was the only one in his cult because people found out real quick that he was a a, a (laughs) nutcase. He's like, hear ye, hear ye, everyone. And he's, my name is Samuel Seabury. Talking to the. Honestly, guys, it's really sad. And here's why. You can tell he's a good dude. Not, not a good dude. You could tell he's a nice guy and you can and go stretch and go and hearing all the interviews and the quotes people would say everyone even all the homeless people in Tompkins Square they were using Daniel because he would let them get high off his weed for free but that's how everyone learned about all this prophecy and stuff because he would just get high and he would just go off and off about how he's the Lord of Lords and how he wanted to have five children with 25 different women each and and then he wanted oh, to create each. he he wanted to create a quote master race and at some point he even pulled out a copy of Mein Kampf oh, oh boy. shit he became upset obsessed with Hitler and but not because he wanted to be Hitler or anything Wait, but so Mein Kampf is still in writing like that's still it's in print yes yeah, in print I tried to buy it um before at the book sale but I didn't I want it it was at the bookstore yeah 
No, I mean, you can. Mein Kampf is not. It's just Hitler's autobiography. Mm. I mean, it's a lot of Jew bashing, obviously. Knowledge is power. You got to read it. You just not going to read it. You know, you see what he was you know, trying to say. If you want something really fucked up, read Putin's freaking manifesto that he put out. No. <laughs> Anyway, so this was definitely a cult of one. He wanted to create a master race with five children, 25 women each, which is five times 25. 125. 125 kids. And he got obsessed with Hitler and he had a copy of Mein Kampf, but not because he wanted to study Hitler. Obviously, he didn't even read German. But on page 696, he found, quote, evidence of the supernatural that somehow, and I, I tried to hear him talk about this. I can't understand it, but somehow on that page, it signifies Daniel Radcliffe was the, quote, second coming of it. Christ. He said it. <laughs> so <laughs> were you just trying to make sure we were paying attention what nothing said what what did i say so so he's he's just he's seeing what he wants to see right he's having like math add up to cert, like the numbers well, he's, his birthday he's, and like on sick page 696 well, he's, 596 he's got mental he's schizophrenic yeah or, or you think psychotic he's, he's got something and he smokes a shit ton of pot we're gonna watch this Actual interrogation video is fucking nuts. That And he talks about cutting up bodies and stuff. Mm. Anyway, let's talk about the murder. Quote, I went to the phone booth on Avenue A and I called up Daniel's beeper number. This, this is what Sylvia's saying. And I said, Daniel, you did it. And he said, you saw it, Sylvia? And I said, yeah. And then he goes, I'm sorry you had to see it, but I had to do it. And he said, come up to the apartment and smoke a joint with me. Uh, no. Now, now it took 10 days to dispose of this body, as, as he'll say. And when the police did get there there was nobody left no body no no body's body left there was no there was no nothing, remains nothing was nothing, left yeah so he did a really good job come up to the apartment and smoke a joint with me and then she said daniel meet me in Tom- Tompkins square i'm not going to the apartment so he met me in the park and he was apologizing sylvia i'm so sorry i had to do it i had to do it so anyway he said even in the interview he gives which the police have never even went to verify they just think it is because he's a a nutcase. He said that he was with his friend from the satanic church in Brooklyn Mm -hmm. and the police never looked into this. And Monica was in the room. This is the murder day. Monica was in the room and she said, you have to leave by tomorrow. And if you don't get out, my friend with a pit bull is going to come and get you out. She walks back into the bedroom and slams her door. The friend, the satanic friend, says loud enough for Monica to hear, quote, what? You haven't killed her yet? She comes out of the room yelling at the friend. And then as she starts to return to the bedroom, he grabs an extension cord. Daniel Rackwitz grabs an extension cord and starts choking her out with it. Dang. That's what he says. In his interrogation, he says oh. that she pulled a knife on him and he did a karate chop to her throat and she oh. died like that. It, it's, I, and, you know, whatever. Jesus. He killed Sylvia? Dang. No, no. Monica. Monica. He started to strangle her and then she scratched up his arms pretty bad. And anyway, so that's what he told Sylvia. Now they're in the park getting high when he's saying all this. Quote, he had choked her to death and when she was dead, he said he stomped on her head 10 times and stabbed her over 30 times. He told me that he used her chest as a carving board. He cut her head off. He took her arms and legs off and he used her chest to cut the bones and everything off. And he cut all of this up and he did it in the bathtub. He cuts the head off. We know where the head's at. It's in the pot. Mm-hmm. That goes down. It boils to the skull, right? Mm-hmm. The bones, you cut off all the arms. They said that he cut this body up into about a thousand pieces, which is a, a, a lot of pieces. A thousand pieces. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of pieces. Yeah. So what he would do is cut it up where everything can kind of fit into like a pot. He would boil it. He would get all the flesh off and then flush the flesh down the toilet. He goes to the hardware store and spends $80 on tools to kill her up and to clean the apartment. A 13 inch carving knife was one of those and a metal pole to break her bones. Quote, and he boiled her and he was still cutting her up and well, actually uh, no, I'll read this. 
And he boiled her and he was still cutting her up. He hadn't finished yet. He was cutting her up into little pieces, over a thousand. And then he flushed her down a toilet. So, but he still has the bones. So he took all the bones and he puts these bones in this, this uh, plastic bag. And then he puts these bo- the bag in a bucket and then the bucket in a duffel bag. He then takes the bucket of bones with the skull to 43rd Street and 11th Avenue in an army duffel bag. That is the port authority where you, I think, that's where you check your baggage before you mm-hmm. s- something to port authority. You check baggage there or something. Uh-huh. Anyway, they have lockers that you can rent. And he'll say this in the interview. He rents a locker. He gets a ticket and he puts all the bones in this locker so he can dispose of it later. So it's not in the apartment. He's got to take it somewhere out of town, mm-hmm. these bones, and he can't flush them down the toilet. No. So he puts them in this port authority locker. They give him a ticket and then he loses the ticket. So he can't actually open the locker. <laughs> <laughs> he can't and and it's almost like oh, <laughs> shit man it's, it, al- it's almost like rat race at the yeah. end of rat race when they get to yeah. the locker he'll he'll say this in the interview he loses the ticket because he got high and he lost the ticket so he can't even reclaim He's the like, bag man anyway. <laughs> where did i put that thing man <laughs> Uh, what do you guys think? Oh, I mean, wow. I feel like this just heated up real quick. How is this not a movie? Yeah. This is totally a Seth Rogen movie. Yeah, agree. All right, hold on. So, now the whole thing took 10 days to do this, right? He did say that him and his satanic friend did eat a little bit of the brains. No. Yeah, if you see, you see this from the Daily News right here. This all took 10 days. Sylvia said it continued to smell up there. Now, she was going to the apartment the whole time, and she said you can smell it for the, from the street. She said you can smell this decomposition from the street. So he's like, okay, I'm going to clean it up a bit. And that's when he bo- you know, really boils down all the skin and flushes it. Mm-hmm. They actually took up all the toilets and, and plumbing, which I don't I know. I bet how. it ruined the whole building's plumbing. They didn't find anything. He did a really good job, apparently. He had it to where it was just bone and a skull and he would get angry at Monica. He would spit on Monica's skull and then he would say, well, hey bitch, at least you'll always have a home. And he told me that, quote, she looks more beautiful now than she ever did. All right. Wow, what a dick. What do you think this guy got? Hopefully Uh, life. Yeah. Uh Uh-huh. No, wait. Did he, is he in a facility? Was he in an alter, he was saying he was in an altered state of mind maybe when he was committing the crime? All right. Once Sean went to buy some dope and he saw Daniel cooking some of the meat and Daniel says, quote, he ate this woman. He didn't eat the whole thing, but he did eat human meat. Oh yeah. He fed her to the homeless, says Hank, who lives on East 5th Street. Oh, wait, no. So this is from the Daily Star. Satanic killer chopped roommate into pieces before feeding home human soup to the homeless so i told you how he was a nice guy he would feed feed all the homeless people in tompkins park so he took the brains i think it was just the brains and a little bit of the innards he cooked them up and and gave everyone soup we should call so, it he we should call it soup nazi since he was reading from mine Kampf. so technically oh every <laughs> <laughs> no soup for you <laughs> So technically everyone, I mean, he got rid of the evidence. Great. Everyone in top, every homeless person that ate that soup that day is technically cannibal, you know? Yeah, but not by choice. A few days after it happened, before it hit the papers, while the rumor started spreading around the village, the homeless, the homeless in the park were going, yeah, Dan did give us soup yesterday. So. Wow. I mean, it's like they, uh, remember we did on July 4th, Joe Metheny is yes. cooking human burgers yep. and stuff. If anything comes out of this and story, Willie Picton. Mm-hmm. if anything comes out of this story, I hope it opens people's eyes for one thing to homelessness, for another thing to realize the, un- to understand that what type of person he really was and that he had a fear of people being homeless, especially when they have some type of mental illness. I still don't blame Daniel for that. And as far as I'm concerned, Daniel will always be my friend. The jury, they took 19 hours to to determine this guy as insane, insane. So he's still in a mental hospital to this day when he got the sentence from the jury of him being not criminally responsible because he's insane. He thanked the jury and said, you know, thank you, everyone. I hope someday we can all smoke a joint together. (laughs) (laughs) And no one's heard from him since he's still locked up in the mental institution. (laughs) 
Wow. I, I do want to watch his interrogation video. It's I've watched it a couple of times. This is epic. Okay. It's 14 minutes long. No worries. So I don't know. What do you think? Wow. So we're going to watch the interrogation and then poop cruise. Yeah. But I hope you guys enjoyed it. That was Daniel Rakowitz. I, Perfect. You know, he was the, the butcher of Tompkins Square Park. Hmm. The, the man that fed the Swiss dancer to the homeless. I mean, you can't make that shit up. No. And how the fuck has no one heard of that story, man? Crazy. Yeah, we'll see in 10 minutes and that link will be on the Patreon for our top tier supporters. But that's all I have. So, all right, until next time, good night, you lovely, lovely people. <laughs>